Cool, kia ora koutou. I'm Lilia um, from Territory 3 and I'm here with John Holt, also from Hello. Territory 3. Um, and today we are joined by Nicholas Lane and we'll be chatting all about going from school to startup. So um, the different path of instead of going to university or other tertiary education, um, what, what that journey is kind of like um, and how founders could potentially like assist that journey if they're looking to hire um, talent fresh out of high school. Um, so Nicholas currently works um, at Zero as product owner and has had a couple of startups along the way as well. Um, so very stoked to have him on today and yeah, just be chatting about um, this whole concept of yeah, going from high school to, to working in startups. Um, we'd love for this to be interactive. So if you have any questions, um, chuck them in the, the Q&A or, or the chat space as well. Um, and we'll, we'll get to those um, as we do. Um, yeah, so cool. Pass over to John. Cool. Well, hey, Nick, thanks for joining us. Um, Thank you. You know, I was just reflecting before we started this on uh, the journey uh, from meeting you originally. I think you actually bunked school to, uh, to turn up to one of our Kiwi Landing Pad jams. And uh, you had some great questions and it was pretty clear you were already kind of thinking about the entrepreneurial path. In fact, you had a business as well. So uh, up and running at high school. So it'd be really cool if you could just give us like a, a minute or so on you and, you know, kind of what, uh, I guess, yeah, the journey that kind of leads us to asking you questions about where you've got to now, you know, several years after first engaging with Kiwi Landing Pad, now known as Territory 3. But before I do that, um, uh, some of you may notice, and a lot of you will watch this on demand, uh, we've got a very different setup here today, um, very uh, uh, much more professional than normal. I think I'm yeah. usually zooming in somewhere uh, with sort of trees and, and, and outside stuff in the background. So big thanks, actually, uh, as a result of one of our office hours here in Christchurch yesterday to Dark Spaces, um, who have got a really cool offering that they're looking to scale. But the first one is up and running in Christchurch, if you are a Christchurch uh, viewer and you can actually uh, hire this space out on an hourly basis with all the professional kit we've got yeah some fancy stuff yeah second screen great camera um, lighting everything and 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 uh, yeah it kind of feels like being uh, hosting the news so um, a big thanks to the team here and you can see the offering uh, and book it I believe on darkmatter.nz so Many, many thanks. It was uh, it was great to be able to help out and promote this um, literally a day after sort of meeting the team. So also a big shout out to our, our um, uh, foundation sponsors as well. So New Zealand Trade Enterprise, Bank of New Zealand. Um, and it's great to be able to um, uh, to have you all on board and bring you our weekly webinars. So Nick, tell us a little bit about the journey. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me along. Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, the journey did start in kind of like my final year of high school, um, starting a small startup as part of the Young Enterprise Scheme. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, had, had been involved slightly before that in, in another startup based out of Creative HQ. Um, and so the, the combination of those sort of couple of couple of years experience then really like sparked my interest in technology and startups and, and that whole ecosystem and world. And I was very lucky to meet um, lots of folks in that space along the way, um, yourself in Kiwi Landing Pad uh, being one of those, and yeah, connected up um, with Kiwi Landing Pad the, the year after leaving high school as part of the Y Pilot program um, that at the time Sean and, and John you were running. Um, and then, yeah, spent, spent a year um, really just gaining exposure um, and being able to kind of go deep on. Uh, on technology companies and startups and the different roles and um, ways in which they operated uh, and was fortunate to be able to um, travel as as part of that back when we could travel the world um, to a few different markets um, around around the world London um, Paris and, and San Francisco and spend some time getting to know um, startup founders and and um, people working in startups and technology there um, and was able to kind of like zero in, um, pardon the pun, on, uh, on a, um, an area of startups that I was really passionate about um, in terms of product, product management, um, being a nice kind of synthesis of a lot of the, um, having interest in a lot of different spaces within startups, but kind of not wanting to go too deep into any particular one of them. So um, yeah, when I came back to New Zealand, um, joined uh, a local startup, Raygun, um, who, one of 
one of you know a number of companies now in in New Zealand operating internationally, and that was a fantastic experience in terms of being able to um, build out my the first stages of my product career and and see an enormous breadth of um, opportunities and challenges, um, and then being fortunate to move to zero um, over the last been there about a year now, um, and can you continue to kind of hone and refine that that product management um, career really? So. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So, you know, we're, we're sitting in this environment where obviously we've got a COVID world now. Um, tech in New Zealand is uh, even, you know, since you joined us for the Y Pilot and folks, the Y Pilot was sort of the name that Chan, uh, who was running um, Kiwi Landing Pad at the time, now Territory 3, uh, we, we coined. Um, and it was really the idea of giving high school students with entrepreneurial aptitude the ability to actually test that out in um, some more expensive environments through our community of entrepreneurs um, before they decided to go down that traditional university path. And I think, Lily, are you going to chime in on this conversation mm -hmm. as well? Because sort of zeroing back today in terms of how um, this is important is that we're starting to see certainly in the media and, and a number of our community folks saying just how hard it is to find talent. And so, you know, I think the thing that we talked about a lot around talent, and I think the thing that a lot of founders are challenged with is there's skills and there's capability and then there's attitude. And, you know, together those things kind of form a cultural bond that either makes an employee a good one or uh, a misaligned one with, you know, the role and, and stage. So really keen, and I probably open up to you, Lilia, as well, around... You know, you're sitting there not so long ago in, uh, in the last couple of years of school and sort of you've got this feeling you were in the Young Enterprise Scheme and, and, and doing your business and so forth. So what sort of started challenging you or, you know, raising your questions about whether the sort of tertiary education university path was not necessarily the, the right one? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think it was a, a, a real confluence of factors. I think, you know, first and foremost was was um, fortunate to kind of be surrounded and then continue to surround myself with with people in the in the startup and the technology um, ecosystem and I think those folks tend to think a little bit differently about about the world and I think there's a lot of people in there that that challenge the value of maybe their own tertiary education or um, you know for those who had um, come through into startups in different realms the value of kind of the tertiary education in general so definitely the the exposure to a different way of thinking um, really helped. I think um, as well as that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty when you're coming out of high school about like, you know, where am I going to land in this in this world and, and what am I going to spend my time doing um, and, and where am I going to find my passion? Um, and you also hear so, so much about how fast the world is changing these days. And so I think, you know, when you start to look at those things and then, you start to look at three, four um, year time horizons and 40, 50K student loans. There's just something that doesn't fully equate there about how can, how can I lock myself into something for three or four years, but at the same time have, have certainty off the back of that, that, that what I've learned and the skill set that I've gained is going to be relevant to a world that frankly, no one knows what it's going to look like. Um, and I think, you know, that was true back in, 20, 2017 when I was kind of thinking about these things and I think to to what you've mentioned about um, about COVID and about the changing world and about the move to, to more things being online like that pace of change is only accelerating and so I think that those questions are only more kind of pertinent now. Yeah and what about you Lilia because you did yeah. you did a year at university? Yeah um, I also did Young Enterprise um, Scheme in school so that was really cool um, also yeah surrounding me with people with different ideas about how to do life and business and everything. Um, so that was a really good influence um, for me and, and got me into um, a thing called Venture Up, um, which at the time was like a six week um, uh, business accelerator, but not quite so much of an accelerator. Um, and that was running Wellington. So that was also cool to have another entrepreneurial experience. Um, I think growing up, I was always pretty set on going to university. And so I even um, I did my level threes in year 12 because I, thought I wanted to get to university early um, and kind of, you know, keep ahead of, um, ahead of everyone else. Um, and so I eventually, yeah, I got to uni, um, started doing the commerce degree um, and quickly realized um, 
it, it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, it was, I mean, even lately I've been saying, and, and other people have said to me too, um, the commerce degree is a bit of a joke. Um, it's, you don't really learn that much. I mean, especially first year, it's just re going over what you did in school really. Um, and then when you think about the, the cost of the student loan you, that you're associating with that, um, it, it just it isn't really worth it. Um, I did get to a couple of like 200 level marketing papers um, and for me as well, it was, it was again a case of memorize some stuff and then write it out and you weren't being taught like how to think and, and it was quite outdated as well. Like I'd already had my, um, my social media site Wellington Live at that point and I could see um, I was learning so much more on my own and things that they weren't teaching us um, and so hence that's why I ended up dropping out. Um, However, I did find after dropping out, um, it was quite difficult to, to find, a, find a role in social media, which was what I, I was looking for, um, which was really interesting because in the previous years in the startup scene, I was hearing all of the, oh, like there's this move to not needing, needing a degree um, to get a job and people would care about your experience and everything. And I found that it, it actually wasn't like that straightforward that the, the whole movement hadn't quite reached all the recruiters yet. And the recruiters still just want you to have your degree and your three years exp professional experience. Um, and it was so weird because like, I, I had proven myself to be like one of the best in New Zealand. Um, and they just, they didn't really care. They just don't want to tick their boxes. So I do agree that the movement is happening, but perhaps in a different way and, and through different companies and, and organizations than what we would possibly thought. Um, and that's when I discovered the best way to get a job was just um, who you know, networking. Um, so I think I literally just like posted on LinkedIn, which is where you found me. Um, so that, yeah, eventually I got, I got there. Um, but yeah, it was quite a, a strange experience um, yeah, trying to navigate that. Yeah, and I think um, this is something I'd love to, to dive into with, with both of you. I mean, Nick, uh, I sort of uh, marvel sometimes and I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on, you know, joining the Y pilot program, getting, as you said, in front of a lot of folks, but really not for that long, um, you know, a whole lot of piecemeal experiences. And then you actually, you know, full kudos to you, got into an organisation, you know, to Lilia's point, there's that aptitude, but then there's actually mm. somebody being prepared to take you on board. Yeah. I mean, what were you doing to, you know, as a sort of product person, um, where previously a lot of those product people will have done a degree or had, you know, many years experience, what were you kind of thinking to yourself? I mean, they always talk about fake it till you make it, but I mean, how did you pick up enough, um, not just to actually get the job, because I know that story, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about that a bit in terms of how you applied for the job, but once you're there sitting in the desk, you know, was it like, holy shit, you know, mm. I've actually got myself and hustled myself in here, now what do I do? Or had you picked up enough? Or how did you sort of self-educate around that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And, you know, I mean, full disclosure the answer is always a, a kind of slightly post-rationalized version because i think um you know it's not always as clear when you're in it yeah. what what the answer is and how you're going to do that i think that's an important piece to raise because it you know it, it kind of um provides some empathy to the the people who are like in that in that situation right now trying to bridge that gap into that first first step and something but I, I came across a really good model from um uh, an executive in, in Zero who um, wrote a fantastic blog post on it just the other day. And it talks about the scale of, um, it talks about leadership competence, but I think I think that the model is kind of applicable to any skill set. And you sort of go from, you know, a scale of unconscious incompetence where, you know, you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you're not good at um, to conscious competence and unconscious competence, sorry. So where you're just, you're good at things and you do them without thinking. And then, you know, as you traverse that journey, I guess the first step really is to move to a place of conscious incompetence where you're like, okay, I now know of the things that I'm not good at. And I think that's a really, it's a really big first step to make because it, that starts to frame up, you know, areas where you direct your learning to, you know, um, places where you seek mentorship or guidance you know, focuses for personal development and, and stuff like that. So I think part of the, the why pilot, pilot experience that was so valuable was just moving from that stage of unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. So I was like, okay, well, I now know all the things that I don't know. Um, 
or know of all the things. And then, you know, I think once you once you move into that first role um, in a in a particular domain, um, then you can start to you know hone through experiences and through learning and through um, you know the support and guidance of of people around you to a point of conscious competence, and then hopefully you know unconscious competence where you start to do things by nature and um, by practice over time. But then. I think the beautiful thing about that model is that you realize that like it's an ever evolving process because, you know, as one set of skills moves down that kind of conveyor belt towards unconscious competence, so does the next set of skills kind of sits on to that. And you, you constantly learn, oh, wow, like now I, I didn't know that I don't um, know that. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going very much through that process and through that journey now as much as I was back then. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's that two-step process, like learning what you don't know, you don't know, and then learning about that thing it's, itself. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I guess that sort of brings me to the second part of it. And this is where I'm going to kind of play the age card here. But and we've talked about it a lot, you know, mm. uh, over time is, you know, I think what you described is an ongoing process for life. But the challenge around, you know, young aspirational people uh, having even that mindset and sitting alongside not so young uh, and maybe a little bit defensive or impatient people is like, how do you actually maintain that relationship where you're constantly obviously needing to find these things now you know what you don't know? Um, and that balance between being, you know, a contributing employee because I hear it from a lot of people in my generation it's like oh these young people coming in you know they, they want to be the marketing manager or the head of sales or whatever they don't want to do the the mahi around the uh the work and so forth but at the same time you know that's kind of a bit dated as well because if you've got people who've got a contemporary new fresh way of doing things that's kind of the point of bringing them in but a lot of it comes down, I think I'm really interested in hearing both of you on this, on how you actually interact with these people and kind of, you know, putting it bluntly, don't become a burden in terms of all the questions you ask versus, you know, getting what you need to actually get yourself into a cadence of being able to, to, to do the role you're asked to do. Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I think this is the perennial disconnect in this in this space of, you know, like hiring young talent and, and stuff um and i think it, it's something that i've given kind of a decent amount of thought to over over, over time so i think it's kind of twofold like on the on the case of the employer i think you, you touched on a little bit but i think what's absolutely crucial is just that that open-mindedness you know not coming with a fixed set of what you want this person to be or the role that you want them to play but being um open um, and I think that open-mindedness mind manifests in two ways. The first way is that, you know, you, you have to realize that it's like a two-way street. For anyone who's been a mentor, um, you, you'd you know that, you know, that mentor-mentee relationship is, is a two-way street. The mentor can learn just as much from the mentee in different ways. It can help them to clarify their own ideas, their own understanding standings of, of things. So I think, you know, as an employer, it's important to be open to the fact that based just on you know, having a different perspective alone, um, that person will add value to your organization. Their, their age is kind of a, another one of those crucial aspects to organizational diversity. Um, and then secondly, I think, you know, some of that open-mindedness needs to extend to, um, on, on both sides, needs to extend to the fact that there is a generational difference. You know, we, we grew up in, in very different worlds. Um, and so both employer and employee need to be really open-minded and open-minded to that people are going to think differently about things based on that and that you need to kind of create that space to learn and empathize with one another about why do you think differently and how do you think differently and how can we you know harness that that difference in thinking um, to our collective benefit um, so I think open-mindedness is really really crucial and then I think you kind of touched on it a little bit but like to the young people coming in to employ employees, um, I think it is really about being being patient. You know, like we we grow up in a world that is so instantaneous; everything's at the, the click of the click of your fingers. Um, and so, I, I, I do think our generation 
you know, broadly generalizing here a little bit, but I do think our generation struggles with like being patient with things. I know it's, it's something I've struggled with in my career and I, I still struggle with. It's like, you know, wanting everything to happen now um, and experience the phrase used to wind me up lots because it's it's very amorphous and it's very hard to know like what's the thing I do to gain experience but experience is so crucial and I think experience is the the patience to really master something um and so yeah I think just like employees coming in having ambition wanting to add value is really good but also balancing that with like the patience to go you know there's a lot in this domain and there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to become really good at this thing and so i i need to take the time and have the patience to to gain that experience yeah lilia what are you, what are yeah you I, I definitely agree with the whole the whole patience thing um especially in, in like the whole business world and when you when you start dealing with like governments as, as clients and everything um uh, you know like i i expected things to just like you know happen straight away and and i'd get so frustrated because everything would take so long weeks and months for conversations to to you know reach a, a solid point and I mean now I'm at a stage now that I've been through that I I understand it better and I know that things when you do things like that it is going to take a bit of time um and I'm not as frustrated by it because I just I know that's just we just live with that I mean obviously I would love if the world was more instantaneous um like you know like we, we expect it to be um but I guess yeah we just learn that you just have to put up with the way that the, the older folks um, and, and those kind of large organizations, um, how the way that they operate. Um, so that is just a case of yeah, experience and, and learning how to navigate that. Um, and then, you know, finding the outcomes that you want once, once you understand how it all works. Um, but yeah, definitely have, have had experience in that. Um, and in terms of being, I've, I've still never had like a solid, like, office job or anything so I, I mean I'm lucky with, like working with you it's all pretty flexible as well um and it's probably a, a different experience to um what Nicholas might be going through at, at zero um which is a lot more um I'm, you know like you, you go into an office all the time and, and there's more deliverables and things and, and tasks that you do each day um so you could probably speak better on on that relationship um being in that kind of full-time job um but yeah yeah, I think that's the next interesting piece, right? Is that um, the portfolio lifestyle is something that yeah. a lot of people, oh, well, I mean, you're kind of doing it because. Yeah, I've still, yeah, I've never had that yeah. actual, you know, flatline kind of job, job. Yeah. Um, and then there's a sort of big company, small company thing, Nick, which, you know, you've now experienced. I mean, you know, Raygun's yeah. a very successful organization, obviously, but it's certainly not as big as zero. I mean, any thoughts mm. sort of. Uh, coming into that environment in terms of what surprised you or maybe what you had to change or alter in your expectations? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a process of learning still a year and you still are learning so many things about scale. I think the thing that has been fantastic about Zero is, you know, it's felt like a, a bit of a, a masterclass, you know, but in, in that, I think it, comes as a function of having you know more resources to really be able to dedicate more time to to doing things really really well um and also having a lot of a lot of people um around you uh to be able to support you with with a lot of depth to um certain facets of the role you know when you have a a whole user research department um as opposed to you know one person trying to do that as part of their job you naturally can go really, really deep into that whole domain and, and um, learn learn more in, in that regard. So I think, I guess there's, there's kind of, you know, um, pros and cons to both. I think in terms of like when you're, a, when you're a young person sort of starting out in that career, I think those small organizations are fantastic because you can build, um, you know, strong relationships with lots of people in the organization you can um, gain exposure to a lot of a lot of different things very quickly because you know there's things that need to be done and, and there's not as many people around to do them so you can just kind of roll up your sleeves and, and get stuck in and, and learn things um, and then you know I think a large organization can be fantastic and provide as much opportunity more on kind of the depth side of being able to really like 
focus on a specific area, but focus on doing it really, really well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And one of the things we talked uh, with the folks at Canterbury University and the future learning about earlier in the week was um, just um, expectations from people uh, about what a job is actually going to entail. So I know when we uh, took off on the Y pilot for the year that uh, you and I sort of worked together, you were pretty much, you know, coming out of letter socks was the business, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you've created a business at high school, gone through that whole cycle of understanding sales, getting product, all that sort of stuff. And you, uh, if I get it right, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, you, you were looking to round out that sort of entrepreneurial sort of lead role as, as the sort of career or next step. And then you you engage and you, you know, you come out with a, with a real passion and, and wanting to get deeper into the product stuff. What, what sort of changed for you um, as you sort of got some real world awareness that sort of made you want to make that shift? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that real world awareness was like going back to that kind of unconscious incompetence kind of thing. It was just like realizing things are hard, you know, and that's true. Of, that's true of product. That's true of being a founder. That's true of sales. It's true of like, you know, all the roles we play. Like there's so much depth to everything to do it really well and to really master it. And I think, um, you know, so th I think with that perspective, you take a different lens of like, you know, I want to dedicate five, 10 years to doing something and doing it really well. What, what is it that I want to do? Um, I think product in particular stood out to me because I think it had a lot of the dimensions of um, being a founder and, and being a, a leader in a way um, that because of, you know, that role within the organization, the way organizations are structured and the, and the sort of division and, um, uh, look towards the future that product managers and product people provide um, the teams and the companies. So I think there was a lot that stood out about that role that I really enjoyed. And I think it kind of, you know, I knew that what I learned in that discipline and domain would be, you know, would serve me into the future um, if and when I decide to, you know, be a founder again. Um, so I think, yeah, that was, that was kind of, um, that and then the other thing that drove that decision was just almost just realizing you know i think i had some quite humbling moments throughout that journey with with y pilot and with kiwi landing pad of um you know realizing how much i have to learn and how much i have to learn from from others and that, of course you know i'll add value as i go along the way there but you know almost feeling like there's a whole lot of things that I want to learn before I take another crack at this again myself yeah. um and you know I want to be able to when I do take another crack at it do it do it well and do it justice and so I think just you know really just falling to a place of just enjoying absorbing and um you know gaining experience for other, other people there's a lot of there's a lot of ownership and responsibility that comes with um being a founder and you know the buck stops with you and um so I think you have to be really, really committed to taking that that on and know that that's what you really want. And I think right now I just really want to learn and grow in environments and from smart people. Makes a lot of sense. So if I play that back, we haven't seen the last of, of Nicholas Lane, entrepreneur. It's just uh, he's in he's in training and uh, in, in training camp for the next big one. I Most call. certainly. Most um, certainly. That's yeah, pretty similar to me actually. Is yeah, me, I'm just wanting to, to learn heaps, meet heaps of people for the next few years before I then decide to step into something and act, like actually start a serious startup and, and hopefully be in a position by that point where I, I'll be able to do it really, really well. Um, but yes, it's kind of similar for me. It's, 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 it's like a learning to, to allocate kind of a few years to that, to get yourself ready um, to be successful later down the track i guess well if it's any um, consolation i just think that never stops i mean you know, yeah. one boss said to me one day it's a journey not a destination mm. right so but i think we often forget that and we lose patience or we just don't put ourselves in the shoes of new folks coming on board who mm. just have a shit ton of stuff to learn mm. to become increasingly useful but i think you hit the the nail on the head there around if you can have a mindset coming in going, I just need to be able to work out where I'm adding value. And sometimes in the early stages, that value is just about asking good questions to sure. get yourself educated, but also to, to get people 
you know, in the higher up sort of level at, at some point to think about whether they're making the right decisions or they've got the right attitude because everyone needs that that sort of kick or um, reminder about just is everything actually optimised? Um, yeah. We've got I, a question I, from... Oh, sorry, yeah. you go. Oh, I was just, just going to add, like, I think, you know, I know I know, purpose is also something that's dear to your heart, John, and, um, and I think our... our generation in particular is is incredibly driven by purpose and the purpose that organizations have and so I think you know part of that decision to start start your own thing would come of, uh, of having a really strong or for me at least a strong sense of like this is the purpose and in, in, in the, the contribution to society more broadly that I want to have uniquely and I, and I don't you know feel that there's other organizations out there that are having that that um, contribution to society um, and I'm definitely, you know, open to that happening in the future. But but right now, and particularly at zero, with with the strong kind of drive around purpose and, and social good that, that the organisation has, it sort of aligns with my values and and the contribution that I want to see had in the world. And so there's there's alignment there that that adds to that sense of you know being comfortable in that employee role. And, yeah, and we might come back to that in a minute, I think, because it's a really important point, not just from an employment point of view, but also consumerism is changing and wanting to see that as well. Um, sure. Steve Baker's got a question for us. Um, he's saying, loving the session so far, but what advice would you give? It's a great question, actually. What advice would you give to founders looking to hire students uh, straight out of high school or early in their higher education journey? Yeah, for sure. No, um, it is a great question. Um, I think really, really, it's just, it, it goes back to kind of that open-mindedness, um, you know, like having, obviously as, a, as an organization, you need to have some expectation of the role that that person is going to um, perform in your organization and what sort of things you want them to deliver and those sorts of things. But I think more broadly, leaving, leaving space for, you know, that person's unique perspective um, to kind of shine through and add value to your organization. Um, and also, you know, being open-minded to, like if, if there is a, a generational difference, you know, how does that person think differently about the world? What can you learn from them? What can they learn from you? So I think just approaching it openly and, um, and with good intent. Um, and then I think also, you know, you know that, that there's a journey from, where someone is to, you know, a point of really strong competency within a, a technology organization. And that journey is paved with lots of different, um, uh, different things that help, help people learn and grow to become really competent in, in that role. Um, and I think traditionally it was university and now we're seeing that kind of being pulled apart and, and other things like Inspiral Dev Academy or, you know, the on-demand learning programs kind of put in place. So. I think understanding, you know, maybe if, if someone's not kind of like fully taken that step into that point of full competence and, and, and experience already in, in the role, what parts of that, what, what's sort of left to go in that journey for them and what, what can you sort of, um, what cobblestones can you help to kind of pave on the last little bit of that road to get them to that point? Um, and yeah, and I, I think then, you know, that that is true of, of young people going into tech, but it's also true of, you know, anyone who's moving laterally in their career at any stage of their life um, into technology. And, and um, given the way the world's going, we're going to need to kind of like pave a lot of those pathways for people in order to make up for the sort of shortage of, of skills that we really have in the sector. So Yeah, you're right. Lilia, what would you tell um, somebody hiring hiring uh, straight out of school? Or... Yeah, um, one of the things that I, like I've come across, and and it would be cool um, if people were more um, I don't know the word, but so essentially is um, if you can give them a bit more freedom and not just have just your set tasks that they do, but actually let them bring their ideas. Because I feel like the reason you hire a young person is because they are going to bring cool ideas and they are going to improve, you know, your startup, your business. Um, Cause otherwise you could just hire someone who's, who's like 40 years old and is just going to do exactly what they're told. And that's it. So I feel like the reason you hire someone young is because you want 
new ideas and, and new ways of working coming in. So I think if you can give them some freedom and don't just lock them, you know, straight into you do this and that, and you can't do, you know, like anything more than that. Um, and I know there's, you know, there's always going to be processes in terms of um, like, say they want to make a change that they'll have to get approval and, and things like that. Um, and maybe make that process clear um, so that they understand it and they don't feel squashed, you know, like they can't actually do what they want to do. Um, so I think that's super important is just let them have some freedom, like a bit, like controlled freedom, but enough freedom that they can actually do cool things and actually make that change in the business that, that you want them there for. Um, so I think that that would be my main piece of advice is, yeah, get, let, them, let them have some freedom. Well, that's a relief because it makes sense to me yeah. on that other side of the Yeah, point. good. But, you know, I guess on, on the other side of the coin, I think, in my experience, it's just having some pretty direct conversations. I think we don't have enough of those about yeah. where the boundaries actually lie, yeah, both in yeah. terms of what needs to be done, even if it's not, you know, the coolest part of it, but mm. it just needs to be done versus embracing, you know, that attitude that uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question and, yeah. and it all adds value sort of rolling up. Um, but increasingly, you know, we see, you know, we, we talk to founders all the time who are challenged with, just feeling like you know their their requirements even in that communication piece are lost in translation somehow and I, I would just wonder possibly whether it's because there isn't enough sort of direct conversation mm. at the worry of you know legal at the worry of you know it's kind of a cotton wool world in some some places which feels like kind of hardens up mm. as you get into yeah. life out of school and out of home and you know into your own Sort of accommodation in the you know the real world anyway so it's not really doing anyone a, a service but mm. um i want to come back to that purpose piece um and it is a bit of a soapbox of mine as you know but um you know now you've and, and you know a lot of founders are obviously doing b2b businesses but a lot of them ultimately still have to really understand regardless of what it is b2b b2c what that consumer kind of element is and i'm really intrigued in your thoughts around how you see you know they say gen z which um which you folks are I think I'm in, yeah. you're part gen of yeah. is about 30 percent of consumerism today but not only that it has a heavy influence on the sort of baby boomer generation as you know parents grandparents what would you you know in thinking about ideas for future businesses and so forth and, and maybe not about the ideas themselves but about that consumer generation if you were thinking about what they're looking for that maybe might be different to generations beyond that you know as a founder what would you be what would you be looking at specifically that you think there's quite key differences in between a like a, a, a middle-aged person versus a versus a, a gen z right so right, just trying to clarify the question <laughs> so so you know what are the big differences in you know consumer thoughts if any uh -huh between you know that sort of well your parents generation generally speaking oh, okay. so and, kind of, and you in terms of you know the way that you look to buy and we talk about purpose as being one of them you know sustainability yeah. all that things but anything else jump out to you um yeah i mean 100 percent, we do care more about the planet and and you know ethical sustainable organic all those kind of kind of buzzwords of, of the the good kind of stuff um, these days so that would definitely yeah place an influence if you were to hire someone young they would probably want to bring that into your startups if, if they feel um, like they can um, so that's again down to giving them the freedom to, to speak up and everything um, but yeah that would be yeah 100% agree with that um, no. yeah I'll give a kind of two two pointed answer to it I guess the first point would be you know for a bit of kind of like context into into my world let's say and, and i don't know how how different this is to different generations you know but like there's our generation is is, is very acutely aware of a, a plethora of kind of like concerns in society and it, and it causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of folks and so i think it that permeates into you know all aspects of our social interaction you know be that the things that people are posting on instagram the things that you know, our topics of conversation when everyone catches up to have a, have a drink at the bar, you know, in, in the times in the world that we, we do that. Um, and so I think, you know, that awareness that, that 
that those those issues and those topics of conversation are swirling at all times for our generation kind of I think helps to lay some of that empathy of why these decisions are so front of mind when we're consuming things when we're deciding who we work for when we're you know um, deciding what clothes to buy all those all those sorts of things um, and I think to then the point about you know how organizations can think about that um, I think um, Mike Benioff uh, the Salesforce founder um, has a fantastic book Trailblazer and I think he, he's done an, an enormous amount of really incredible work in terms of integrating you know, genuine social purpose into his organization. And I think the way, the way he sort of looks at, looks at it is that, you know, at the heart of your organization is people. And that's true of your community of employees and your community of customers and your, um, the, the communities around you. And really in order for organizations to thrive, communities need to thrive because you need a thriving community of Pers um, prospective employees so that you know the future generation and future workforce will sustain your organization you need a thriving community of of customers so that frankly there's people to buy buy your product um, and then you need a thriving global community um, and you need a thriving environment so that the world's in such a place as as um, your business can thrive the, the environment is there for you your business to thrive so I think it's kind of becoming just crucial that organizations are thinking about that, that wider community around their organization and how they can ensure that community is thriving so that as a result, their organization does thrive. And I think there's something really interesting in that because it, it almost, you know, I think capitalism is, is kind of painted, tarnished with this brush of like being all for itself and, and very selfishly and intent. And in a way it is a selfish intent, like, doing good has to be a selfish intent because you will not thrive into the future unless you do good. So um, yeah, I think his Mark Benioff's model is really interesting in that regard because it kind of like talks to a lot of those crucial elements of capitalism, but in a, in a socially environmentally good way. Yeah. And I think it's a really good point and, and sort of, you know, being a historian by academic training, I think the thing to me is that a lot of the great companies have always shown this mix between purpose and profit. Um, it's not really a new thing, um, but the consumer element, you know, the generational awareness, as you say, is actually almost triggered its necessity in companies rather than the difference between a really great company and, a, and an average company. It's like even an average company now really to stay average has to be much more conscious of the way uh, folks in the big consumer um, and talent um, generations now, which increasingly Gen Z it is, because otherwise they won't be able to attract them either as customers or employees. So you mentioned the anxiety piece before, and it's always a question I ask in these sessions, whether it's a founder or a product expert or, or anybody really. I mean, you know, dealing with anxiety, dealing with with wellness for you. What are your um, what are your steps to to um, to managing balance and and, and good health? Yeah, look, it's, it's a topic of conversation that's like quite front of mind for me. Um, I took a whole week off, not last week, the week before, just because I'd reached that, that point of, of burnout. And, you know, that's, that's wholly on me and the way that I work and the expectations that I place on myself. And, you know, I think any job, you can make it consume too much of your thoughts and, and too much of your time if, if you're not careful about those things. So, you know, I, I would say kind of that, like, I'm still figuring that out. I'm still really working that out. I think, um, you know, where, where I'm coming to in that, that journey is that um, the conversation has to move beyond the kind of tips and tricks of how do you structure your work day and how do you make sure you get your yoga session in at 6 a.m. And, you know, it, it's, it's got to move to the deeper kind of psychology of how do you balance like an ambition and a drive to do things and achieve things with also a perspective that is, you know, on the 40 to 50 to 60 year time horizon. And one that is realistic about the expectations that you place upon yourself and what you can actually achieve in, in meaningful timeframes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if anyone has any, any thoughts or suggestions on that, um, I'd be all ears, but, I think it's just, yeah, trying to get into the deeper, 
psychology of yourself, understanding what motivates you, understanding, you know, your limits, understanding what causes burnout, um, what you kind of can come to naturally and what takes more of your energy, all those sorts of things, like just that really deep self-reflection is, is super crucial in a, in a constantly evolving um, journey. But I think that's how you work sustainably and balance burnout and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I think if someone had worked it out, we wouldn't have effectively, you know, the pandemic before the pandemic of, of mental health and wellness challenges. For sure. I, I think I saw... Oh, sorry. Any uh, thoughts on that? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, I've experienced yeah, the burnout lately. Um, I mean, I think it is a process that you kind of have to just go through. Like, you won't know how to handle it until you've been through it. And, I mean, I try to find the thrill in it. Um, the thrill in life being hectic and things being non-stop and I've been learning a lot about like um blocking out things that don't make life better um and trying to control what is coming to me in terms of my you know my day-to-day -day, um kind of work um if something's not adding value then, then try to get rid of it um and a lot more like self-care kind of kind of things where I can just the, li the little things um I, I don't do yoga or anything like that though um mine, mine's mainly travel related or just relaxing going to sunsets and things like that um since a lot of my travel is also work which is weird um but yeah I, I think it's just a it's a journey that everyone is gonna have to go through and, and it may be painful um but it's it's like, I'm not sure what the alternative is yet. It has said we don't have that solution. Um, so as long as you can make it through um, and, and learn from it, then I, I think that's a good thing. Um, but, yeah, yeah, it's that awareness piece that's crucial really yeah. for a lot of people because often they find out about it or yeah. think about it too late. Yeah. So we were, um, <laughs> sorry, Nick, what were you going to say before? Oh, we... I, I just heard um stat recently, you know, that I think something like 68% of tech workers experience burnout so it, i think you're right it is an it is an absolute pandemic and i think there's a kind of a challenge where employees and employers need to to work together to kind of like reevaluate how they measure employee success in a way because you know particularly when no one's in the office yeah. um it can no longer be like hours sat at the desk um it, it has to be measured on on outcomes um that are created and so that kind of shifts the whole narrative of how organizations measure productivity and success and outcomes and, and stuff like that. And I think that's an important thing that employees and employers sort of work, work together on, particularly small businesses. Cause you know, I can, I can imagine there's a, there's an anxiety of like, you know, you're trying to keep the thing running and, you know, cash flow is a concern and, and just sometimes making it to the next month or the next quarter, or, you know, that, that growth target to raise the next round of funding or something is, is, is really front of mind and really pertinent every day. So, you know, balancing well-being and that is, is a hard thing. Yeah, totally. And I think this current situation and, you know, our thoughts go out to all those folks, you know, locked down in Auckland for, you know, what must seem now like a, an eternity is that, um, you know, working out of your bedroom or your lounge um, actually ends up often for a lot of these people, and this is just not just my experience of tech companies or startups, it's big companies, small companies, there isn't really a release or an escape from, from work. So if you're actually working longer hours doing less, if they're actually asked or provoked to sort of have inflection, which is a bizarre sort of and very unhealthy, I think, sort of um, byproduct of this supposed, you know, it's great. I don't have a commute yeah. to work anymore because yeah. I just get up and, you know, put some clothes on and, and go to work, which I think um, kind yeah. of need to break that cycle. Uh, obviously, yeah. uh, obvious statement for, for Auckland, but even just out into the new world as remote work and work from home becomes, yeah. you know, more accepted and more, proliferated with organizations you've still got to figure out where that circuit breaker is to go into mm. non-work mode yeah. even if you've had the convenience of home yeah there's definitely a lot of work to go i think there's definitely a, the, the whole backfiring is, is definitely started of, of it's not actually that amazing to be working from home every day and mm. you kind of you know there's those little things like maybe just having your office space in a different room and going out for fresh air every, every now and again and, and just kind of create that separation i think a lot of people haven't quite done yet they like they might just be still like in their bedroom kind of thing um but i think that is again it's, it's a journey we're going to go down and i'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion around that over the coming months as well um so we'll see, see what happens yeah, definitely. 
So we're just about uh, in wrap up mode, mate. It's gone very quickly. And again, I really appreciate you being here. Um, sort of some final thoughts, you, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a fairly compressed question to you uh, being uh, so early in life. But, you know, the, the Nicholas Lane that turned up bunking school to the, the landing pad jam versus Nicholas Lane today, if you, if you went back and sort of looked at one or well, doesn't have to be one, but things you might adjust given what you've, what you've learned about, you know, career path and, and where you're headed now, what would, what would the thoughts on that be? Yeah, it's a, um, it's a, it's a challenging question, I think. Um, I, I think I'm on this journey still, but I certainly hope that I've kind of like, made a bit of that first step forward from where I was, you know, like you say, when I did bunk school and turn up the, at the jam, um, to, to kind of being, being a bit more patient with, with things and, and balancing that sense of ambition and desire to learn and grow with, you know, patience to um, not so much slow down, but, but just focus on, really truly sort of mastering something I think you know that first step when I was coming out of school I was I was really looking to kind of like tick a lot of boxes quickly um, to progress and, and, and maybe that's a function of what you got to do when you're early on um, but I think yeah I would just probably tell myself you know like slow down and focus on doing things really really well to the best of your ability and know that opportunities and um progression and you know achievements and stuff will come as a function of that um and you know in turn i probably reinforce that message to myself now for the next 10 15 20 years yeah no it makes sense Lilia, any thoughts um i mean in terms of looking back at what i thought for my career line back in high school i think it's still pretty similar like back then i was like yeah i just want to I want to do big business sort of a, you know Elon Musk Steve Jobs kind of person and I mean definitely still I'd love to still do that um but I think it's a case of like as we get we realize it's it's not as straightforward you know like there are all these different steps along the way um and realizing that you do need to like allocate time to all these different things of like learning and experience and and you know even just exploring the world kind of kind of things like that um like yeah still still same goals but different pathways like like you know like how I thought I wanted to go to uni um and then ended up leaving it because it wasn't what I thought and I couldn't have predicted that I wouldn't have known um so I think that's the thing is like we don't know what's coming around the corner um and I mean I, I love the the idea that the, the opportunities just never stop um and you really never know what, what's going to happen tomorrow um and I yeah try to take the opportunities when I when I can um but yeah just a, it's a more you, when you come into the world you you just get a better understanding of of the re realities of it um I know one of the things that always held me back growing up um in terms of business was this idea that I wasn't ready and that I was I felt because I remember like I was in year nine or, or something and I saw the opportunity when like mobile smartphones started coming in and and I thought oh no I can't start a business because I don't know anything about taxes and I'm going to end up in jail um <laughs> because I don't know about taxes and I thought okay I'll let myself do like a, a year 11 accounting and I did year 11 accounting and I'm like I don't I don't really like learn it like it's, it didn't change um and I thought like I'd missed out on that, that opportunity because I thought I like I was too scared um so I, I'm constantly trying to remind myself like don't don't be scared um, of what I don't know because I mean from what I'm learning as well with founders and everything is a lot of us like we, we don't know what we're doing <laughs> um, we're all kind of just winging it and I wish I'd understood that when I was younger um, so that's something yeah, I'm constantly trying to remind myself is, is it's okay if you don't have 100% confidence in what you're doing um, but as long as you give it a shot um, and you never know what, what's going to how it's going to work out so it's an exciting idea exciting thought yeah i think that yeah. makes sense yeah well nick um thanks so much for joining us the final word is yours i mean you know what i've heard today is uh and you know 
probably just sort of reflecting on founders and what they need to be thinking about sort of engaging with with new talent young talent um, and talent potentially that's decided to go down the alternate path and not go through the university side but as you know as cognizant and recognizing that they've got skills that they need to upskill in but they still you know can start um, you know open-mindedness um, and yeah I think that sort of you know recognizing what creates value is there anything else you know to wrap up you'd like to sort of suggest to the folks a lot of whom will, will watch this on demand you know basically going help me kind of work out my younger uh, kind of employees or whether I as a founder want to take those sort of you know, let's face it, everything's a, a risk really um, in the face of the more traditional sort of, you know, BCom or Bachelor of Software Engineering or whatever uh, uh, employment strategy. Yeah, I think I think all those things, you know, ring true. I think, I think it's just that open-mindedness. Um, and I think if, I guess the thing would be like if, if you make that investment into, you know, looking into, to other avenues through which you can, you know, bring talent into your organization, be that through, you know, young people or be that through people moving, um, you know, adjacently in their careers, maybe a little bit later in life, you know, by looking through those avenues and by looking to the ways in which you can help to pave that journey into your organization and into technology, I think the return will come to you in terms of A, you know, more ease, hiring the people that you need to hire, um, and B, hopefully a, a much greater diversity of thought in your organization and all the sort of creativity and innovation and, and new ways of doing things that um, comes from that. Very cool. Mate, I really appreciate your time. It's been great to have you here. Thanks to Territory 3 community. Um, for those of you who have friends and colleagues who you think might uh, find this valuable, uh, it will be online on demand in a couple of hours. Um, so I really appreciate your time. Thanks again to Dark Spaces and darkmatter.nz is where in Christchurch you now have a super cool space that you can hire by the hour and we really appreciate the team here letting us uh, use it for this webinar. So thanks everybody and, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Nicholas. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Bye. See you later.